Mm -hmm. Tonight I'm going to ask Brother Bob to uh, have a prayer for me. I'm a little distracted tonight. Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight, Father, on behalf of Brother Gibbon. Father, we ask, Lord, that you would um, look on him kindly, Father, that, Lord, that you would strengthen his mortal body. We know, Father, that you've told us that you're able to do this. You're able to quicken our mortal body. But, Father, we ask tonight, Lord, that you would give him strength. And, Father, you would be with his mind, Lord, that you would give him the focus mm -hmm. on, um, on the things that you've shown him. Mm -hmm. We ask, Lord, that any distraction, Father, that um, would, would attempt to hinder him would be taken away. The Father, that you would um, give him a clear mind and a, a mouth, Father, to be able to speak as the oracles of you, Father. We thank you for this. In your son's name, amen. Mm -hmm. amen. Amen. Thank you. Yes, I feel better already. When I got up, I saw Brother Tony and Sister Melissa. I was worried that you weren't here, see, so I <laughs> couldn't get over my worry. <laughs> Now, this is our eighth message in the subject of assurance. And this is a, a challenging aspect of assurance, the implications of assurance. There are, are things associated with, with assurance that must be seen. They're associated with assurance, whether you see them or not, but... To gain the benefit of them, you must see them, that they, they go along with assurance. Their divine, divine associations are never meaningless. And they're all through scriptures. If you have a heart and a mind to see it, that there's a lot of things associated with every main thing God says. It's just, it's like, there, it's like a river. It has a lot of tributaries. Things go with they go with the subject. Now it's the implications of assurance that validate the experience of it. That's what I want to build tonight, build that idea. The implications validate the experience. Now let's first of all take a moment here and define what, what I mean by implications. An implication is a logical association of two or more propositions. They, they are tied together. And the association must hold together. They're not possible associations. The implications are things that are associated with what we're talking about. They're tied to it. It's a network of realities that support assurance. It's not enough just to talk about assurance because it's kind of, in a sense, assurance is kind of a nebulous subject. It's very difficult to like define it or support it just in with words. If you've ever tried, you know what I mean. It, it's a hard thing to define academically, assurance. But it's very real. Amen. Now in salvation, If the first thing is true, the second thing is must also be true. Now, I want to give some examples of this in Scripture. But let me, we're talking about implications. That the two things, proposition is a statement of something that is, and the implication ties something to that proposition so that if it's true, the, the other is true. All right, here's some examples. Romans 8.10. If... Christ be in you, the body is dead. Yeah. Yeah. That's, the <laughs> That's the implication, see? So if you can substantiate that Christ is in you, that you don't need any further proof than that to substantiate that the body is dead because of sin. Because he's, well, you, you see the, impl the implication of it is, <clears throat> but the spirit is life because of righteousness. So that Jesus isn't like dwelling in your body he dwelling in your spirit, which is in your body. Right. And if Christ is in you, the body is non-functional. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
in the kingdom of God. Of itself, it's non-functional. The only thing a body can do is you've got to make your body do this or that. It, it's dead because of sin. Now, here's another. It's the implication now. Romans 8, 17. If children, then heirs. See? Heirs of God, join heirs with Christ. If, there it is again, another one. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. So here's a little, here's a little miniature network of, of implications. If you can substantiate to your understanding that you're a child of God, then, you, then it, that proves, right there, proves you're an heir. Amen. Yeah. See, that's the implication of it. Proves it. And if you're, and you're a joint heir with Christ, who's going to inherit all things. And if you can establish that you're an heir of God, a joint heir with Christ, then you're going to be, if you suffer with Christ, that's the implication, we'll be glorified together with him, see? Amen. So an implication is not an auxiliary, it's, it's not an extra or something that is kind of stands by itself. It is tied to the matter you're, to the matter that is is implicated with. So that if if the if the truth if the implication is true, the fact that it ties is tied to proves to you it's true. Or if you look at it the other way, if the fact is true that the implication is tied to, then the implication is true. It goes both ways, see? See, so if you are in fact an heir of God, you will in fact suffer with Christ. Amen. See, these things go, they go together. <laughs> Here's another. Romans eleven sixteen. If the first fruit be holy... That's they that are of Israel. If the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. So if the, the first fruit conversions of Pentecost, if they were real, then the latter fruits that are falling today, they're real too. See, if the first, if the first fruit's holy, the lump or the full-grown fruit, it's holy too. And if the root... There's the promises that were given to Abraham, the root and fast of the olive tree. If the root be holy, mm -hmm. the branches are holy. Yeah. That's it. Amen. <laughs> well, I tell you, that is a marvelous truth to see. So, so what are you gonna? What are you gonna? If you're gonna study, what are you gonna study? The branches or the root? Amen. Yeah. Amen. See? <laughs> You study the fact of the implications, they, they come along, they're tied to it. Here's another one. Galatians 3.29, if ye be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. So all these wonderful things that's been promised to Abraham, I'll bless you, I'll make your name great, I'll make you a blessing, you know. If you're Christ. You're Abraham's seed. You're the beneficiary of all the promises given to him. If you're Christ. So you examine, am I of Christ? You examine yourself to see if you be in the faith. And if you if you if you're satisfied on this point, and you're not speculating about it, that you're Christ, you're an heir of the promise. Amen. One more. Galatians 4 7. Wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. See, that's the implication. The implication is heir of God through Christ. The main fact is son. But no, God doesn't have any sons that are not heirs of God through Christ. <laughs> And conversely, there's no heirs of God through Christ that are not sons. So you see how the implication is tied together. Now, of course, in discussing something like this, you have to learn to think within the context of salvation. And that's not as 
easy as it may appear. To think within the context of salvation, like a context, that's the room you go in to do your thinking. So when you're thinking about the things of God, you can go in the room of human duty. And there is a room of human duty, and I make no, mistake, make no mistake about it. You can go in that room and do a lot of heavy thinking, and you'll not come out with much confidence. You'll not come out with much assurance. And you can uh, go within the context of what, sh what should I do? And there are, there's a room called what should I do? And it's a lot of things in there. But I suggest that when you consider the things of God, and now I want to underscore, this is not simplistic. A non-thinking person cannot do this. A non-contemplative contemplative person, a person who doesn't think deeply or dwell on the thing for a while, cogitate on it, they can't see this. They can't even get in the room of salvation, see? Because most of God's comments and most of his affirmations are about his great salvation. That's, what, that's kind of what the main thing he talks about. And so that should be the main thing we think about. And as you think within the context of salvation, that's what gives worth and effectiveness to your thinking. Then the implications, they just come along. And now it's just a matter of them you, you having your eyes open, you begin to see them, not because you thought about them, not because you tried to define what the implications are, not because you sought to find, well, what is tied to salvation? It's, that's not the way you find it. You find it by probing into the salvation of God, seeking as best you can to understand what it means to be saved. And when you do, then it's just in a matter of time, these, these implications, the things that are tied to salvation, they, they begin to open up to you. And when they do, assurance, it gets pretty robust. Amen. God and the purpose... It, you want to think about fundamental things in salvation is God, the purpose of God, and Jesus Christ the Savior. Those are like the pillars. And the gospel, that's the that's the message that tells about this. And as you contemplate salvation with God being the main consideration, the purpose of God, and the person of Christ and his accomplishments, and that's kind of what you're using to define salvation. You're not defining salvation by what happens to you. This is not how you define salvation, but you, you'll get all discouraged. You'll not find enough evidence for what God's done in you. You'll end up guessing about a lot about it. You've got to look at what God said he was going to do in salvation. Give them a new heart. Give them a new spirit. I'll dwell in them. I'll be their God. They'll be my children. I'll not remember the sins anymore. And, so, and you begin to, as you begin to consider that, what God's going to do, if he has in fact worked in you, that will all of a sudden that will surface. You'll be able to correlate your experience with what God said he was going to do. Amen. That's one assurance, see. Amen. And then along with that, it's almost like a daily discovery Things that are tied to that begin to open up, and when they do, you got to marvel you didn't know it before. It becomes so apparent to you. Now I want to deal with the implications themselves. Some of them, we'll just have to deal with a few of them here. I want to make some general observations, first of all, that a lack of assurance introduces jeopardy. Now, there's a lot of people don't believe this. They really don't believe this. The lack of assurance introduces jeopardy. It makes a person vulnerable to the wicked one. Because the wicked one can shout a thousand reasons to you why you're not in. And why you shouldn't be accepted. And, you're, and you won't be able to refute them, see? So assurance is necessary. Without it, there's jeopardy. And when you know, when you think... How few people 
percentage-wise, how few people have assurance. This is alar an alarming observation because these people are like vassals of the devil. The devil can pretty much have his will with them. And if it was not just for the protection of Christ, I mean, they'd have been gone a long time ago. And secondly, what God does is intended to be made known. Amen. Amen. See, so God told you what he's going to do in salvation. He started announcing it way back. He gave an initial announcement in the garden. You, you knew right off the bat that in salvation, Satan's the one that's going to be frustrated. Right. It's not going to be God. Amen. It's not going to be just a handful of people are saved that most of them are going to be lost. That'd be God frustrated. So right away he tells, right off the bat he told you what was involved here. That what God does, he wants it to be known. That's why ordained preachers and teachers and evangelists, that's why Jesus ordained apostles. He wants it to be made known what he does. And he does what he announced he will do. Amen. And thirdly, resources are available with assurance. That's the implications tied to assurance. That can't otherwise be known or possessed. If you don't have assurance, you can't have the implications. You can't have the stuff that's tied to it if you don't have the assurance itself. It'd be just be like a, someone sent you a truckload of merchandise. I mean, it's not that you wanted a truck. You want what that truck is a carrying. That's right. But if you don't get the truck, <laughs> you can't have what it's carrying. Yeah. Assurance is a truck. It's a gigantic vehicle that's bringing all kind of wonderful resources, which I'm calling implications, bringing all of these things to you, but if you don't have the assurance, you can't have the other things. And lastly, salvation, in all of its complexities, is real. So we can't lose our bearings here. When things are hard to explain, hard to understand, we can't be tempted to think maybe this is not real. Maybe God's salvation is not real. Maybe... The indwelling is not as real as I think it is. You, you, we can't allow ourselves to think in that manner. So God's salvation is real, Amen. which means what he intends to do and what he does is real, which means everything tied to that is real. So we talk about assurance. That's just one of the things tied to it. But to, assurance has its own warehouse. <laughs> When you get assurance, it just comes. It's a, like a warehouse that's full of things. Now, here's some implications, some associations with assurance. If you have assurance, you have these things. One is it impacts on how you pray. Assurance affects how you pray. Here's what John said, First John five fifteen. If we know that he hears us. Whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Well, that's an implication. It's conditioned now on assurance, see. If we know that he hears us. I believe the preceding verse says, if we ask anything according to his will, we know that he hears us. So you don't want to be guessing around at what God's will is. I wonder if it's God's will for me to have a a minivan or a pickup truck. <laughs> like, I mean, some people pretend that they're actually getting information on this. I don't believe them, understand. I'll even take it further than that. Some people wonder, I wonder if I should marry Jane or Ruth. Well, if you don't have enough sense to know who you should marry, you shouldn't get married. Yeah, that's really the way it is. You, God's given you enough information on that. So see, what I'm saying is you can get caught up in prayer about things that really just have to do with you. Yeah. They don't have to do with what God's doing or ever, everything else, and they're pretty much centered in the earth. But if you know that he hears you, 
Whatsoever we ask, we know we have the petition. Have the petition doesn't mean we know he heard us. It says we know we have them. So ask yourself the question, like, when was the last time I prayed something like this? Yeah, you should be able to do some pretty heavy thinking here. You should be able to come up with something, or at least come up with the ambition, Lord, th this is how I want to pray. I want to ask things that, that are according to your will. I know they're according to your will, and you've already made a commitment. There's an implication to this. Yeah, You'll have what you ask for. If you say, Lord, that I might receive my sight. Yeah. He got it. <laughs> now there's some other things we know. We know that faith and hope and understanding, they are implications of assurance. They're tied to assurance. So we had already talked about the full assurance of understanding. See that understanding is one of the things that's in the warehouse of assurance. Why is it some people have a hard time, they have a hard time understanding? You've probably known people like this. Maybe you've been one yourself. You just It's just hard to have any confidence that you really know what's going on, what God means. You don't understand. Uh, why is that? Because you don't have assurance. That's why it's that way. Assurance produces this understanding. And it, it produces a hope. When you have assurance, there's something that goes along with it. Hope comes along with it. It's called the full assurance of hope. And when you come in the presence of God, faith comes along with it. You have the full assurance of faith. See, faith, hope, and understanding, these are all implications, things that are tied to assurance. So if you have assurance, I want to make sure I am saying this as plainly as possible. You can go after understanding as though it like stood by itself. And you could go after faith as though it stood by itself. And you go after hope like it stood by itself. Or you can seek to have assurance to which these things are connected. Amen. In other words, you want to come to the point where you're comfortable before God. Right. We're not afraid to come before God. <laughs> Amen. Now we're looking at things that are they're implications of assurance. They're tied to it. Now here's another. Our trials are best addressed when we have assurance. Now I'll give you a couple of expressions that say this. Here's Philipp, Paul, Paul's testimony, Philippians 1.9. I know. <clears throat> That's assurance talking. I know that this shall turn to my salvation. Now, he was in prison. You know, he was enduring some difficult things. I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So, in other words, he knew, like, he knew how the kingdom operates. So here he's in a situation he really can't, of himself, he can't do anything about it. He's incarcerated. I imagine it wasn't a pleasant experience. Now he could just settle on that and say, why am I here? Maybe I did something wrong. Maybe that's why this trial's happened to me. I did, I did something wrong. Maybe I'm being chastened. Maybe that's it. But instead, he says, now I'm going to look past this trial because I know the objective of salvation is not trial. <laughs> that's not the aim of salvation the aim of salvation is ever with the Lord that's, so I know whatever this thing is going to yield I already have this assurance I know where I'm going so I know this is going to yield a good thing see some of us have gone through trials some of you have gone through trials hard. they were hard see if you have assurance you can look at them and say look I can't explain why this thing is here I'm not ex can't explain why it's so challenging to me and why I'm having such difficulty but I know that when this thing is over I know I'm going to it's going to turn out to, it's going to work together for my good Amen. that's assurance see? Yeah, that's one of the implications Amen. of assurance and uh, uh, here's an implication of assurance death does not need to be feared See, because you know the purpose of God, 
you know what Jesus done. So you think like this. 2 Corinthians 5.8 We're confident, I say. I say. It doesn't say we are confident, we say. <laughs> so in this matter I speak for the whole household of faith. We are confident, I say. And willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So you think I'm afraid to die? I'm willing. I'm willing to die. I'm going to die anyway, whether I'm willing to, or, willing to or not. But this is what insurance does. You look beyond death. You say, "It's appointed that us wants to die." I, I know I'm going to die. I know I'm in the tail end of my life. I mean, I know, I know this. But it's a major step forward when you get this implication: willingness. I'm willing to be absent from the body. Amen. I mean, I don't think about it as dying. I think about it as being absent from the body. Amen. That's an implication of assurance, see? Amen. Now, here's another implication of assurance. Here's something that comes along with assurance is the ability to do what looks impossible. It's Colossians 3.12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, Bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering. See, put that on. How can I put that on? As the elect of God, you got to have assurance to know you're the elect of God. That's that's a that's an aspect of assurance. You just know. You can't explain this to someone that's carnal. You understand that? That I I know whom I have believed. I'm persuaded he's able to keep what I've committed to him against that day. If you have assurance, this comes along with it. That's the points, that point I'm making in these sub points. If you have assurance, these things come with it. Now once you know this, you look for them. You expect them. And invariably they'll crop up. Here some kind of trial will come and you're not thrown off by it. You stand. What happened? You got the assurance and the implications, the things tied to it come along, come along with it. Now we know that salvation, uh, it can't be worked out in a state of doubtfulness. If you're not sure whether God's received you or not, I don't know if there's anyone here like that or not, but if there is, we need, to, we need to address the subject. If you're not sure that God's received you, you've got to get that thing solved right away. Amen. You've got to abandon all other pursuits till you get that, that thing settled. Amen. Till you know. Because you, you, you can't win this without assurance. You've got to have assurance, and you can't have assurance if you don't know God has received you. And, and I know that some people live in that state for a long time. They weren't sure they wanted to be. It wasn't that they didn't want to be received, it's just that they didn't, weren't sure that they had been. Maybe they said, I haven't done very much, I haven't done enough. But then you get to the point, you say, well, but Jesus did enough. Yes, amen. And I can believe what he did. Yes, and if I do, I'll not be ashamed. God said he that believes won't be ashamed. And then assurance that God begins to to grow up and pretty soon pretty soon you are able to do things you couldn't do before. Yeah. Huh? You found it to be so. Amen. Amen. Now here's another implication. If assurance is real, if it's true, then here's something that you can conclude. Acts 17, 31. He had appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he has given assurance, given assurance to all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Are you, now this isn't like an academic statement, he raised him from the dead, like a classroom study, you know, it's not like that. The thing you want to be assured of is that your Savior is going to be your judge. Well, that's a piece of good news. Now, once you know that, once you know that, 
You won't fear and tremble at the thought of judgment because the one that saved you, loved you, and gave himself for you, that's the one that's going to judge you. And he's not looking for a reason to condemn you. You know that because he laid down his life for us, see? Amen. So it's a powerful, uh, powerful incentive. If, you're not, if you don't know, you're, you're not sure of your identity with Christ, it won't bring comfort to you that Christ is going to judge you. <laughs> See, it only brings comfort to you if you if you know this. Now here's another implication of assurance. First John three nineteen. Hereby we know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before Him. That's the loving of God's people. So if you are assured. Then part of the thing, then you know you're of the truth. <laughs> and the truth makes us free. You know the truth, the yeah. truth shall make you free. Huh? And you're sanctified by the truth. Sanctify them through thy word, thy word is truth. See? So once you know that you are of the truth, that is, you are what God said the people he saved would be. You're able to kind of make this a connection. Then what happens is you assure your heart before him. You're able to come boldly in others. You're able to come in boldly into his presence and say, Lord, will you destroy the righteous with the godly? You think what boldness it took to say that. How about 50? How about 40? Yeah. How about 30? How about 20? How about 10? How about 5? See, that took, that took boldness. Yeah. See, you couldn't, be, you couldn't do that if you weren't assured that uh -huh. God, God, like, received you. Amen. And that shows you that God will reason with you, even though he may at the end say, well, but they're not going to be 5. You know? He didn't actually say that. He just said, well, as far as you go, I'm in out. And yes, I'll spare him. And then suddenly it dawns on you. Why don't I don't have to fear the end of the world and the coming of Christ? Because God's not going to destroy the righteous with the unrighteous. That's right. So when the wrath of God is poured out without mixture, it's not going to affect me because mm -hmm. I've been accepted. He's Amen. not going to see that that's assurance. Amen. That's one of the implications that go along with it. I'll name a few more here. The effect of righteousness is quietness, we, we'd call it peace, peaceful heart, reigning of peace, quietness and assurance forever. The work of right, see the working righteously is associated with assurance. Once you have assurance, the hardest workers, the hardest workers and most ardent laborers in the kingdom of God are those that have assurance. They work the hardest. Why? Because that's an implication. That's something tied to assurance. Now how about peace? Peace is tied to assurance. Jeremiah 14, 13. I will give you assured peace in this place. Assured peace in this place. <laughs> Which is kind of tumultuous. I'll give you assured peace once you have this assurance, see this peace. Just assurance and assure when you have assurance, Jesus has said, Peace. Be still. Yes, amen. Be still. See, these turbulence cease. These threatening waves cease. That's assurance. That's tied to assurance. Yeah. Believe me now, brother, when I tell you you get it when you have assurance, you do get this. Yeah. This comes along. Peter, he spoke about assurance. Acts 2.36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly, know assuredly, the assurance, that this same Jesus whom ye crucified, he hath made this same Jesus whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. All right? If Jesus was crucified, he now is Lord and Christ. Yeah. Uh -huh. See? You can know this assuredly. 
God said he wouldn't leave him dead. He wouldn't leave him, wouldn't leave his body in the grave or his soul in Hades. He, would, he wouldn't leave it there. So if Jesus died, you don't need any further proof than that. God's made him Lord in Christ. You can know that assuredly. Amen. You don't have to speculate about it at all. And how about this believing of the gospel? 1 Thessalonians 1.5 Our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. And he said, you knew what manner of people we were. We lived consistently with the gospel we preached. So when you believe the gospel, believing the gospel is tied to assurance. They, they travel along together. Here's another one. Hebrews 6.11 We desire that every one of you to show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. So diligence, stick to not quitting. Sometimes we just need to stand up and say, don't give up. Don't. Don't give up. Don't do it. Stay in there. Keep fighting the good fight of faith. Assurance is tied to diligence. And a person who ceases to be diligent has lost their assurance. They've sent it away some way. When you draw near to God, you draw near to God in full assurance of faith. See, part of the implications of assurance, the thing, one of the things that's tied to it is being able to come into the presence of God. Amen. That's one of the things that's a right that all people with assurance have, full assurance of faith. Drawing close to God. And remember the Ephesians says we have we have access to Him with confidence. Now, how about this being tied to assurance? Continuing a faithful ministry. Persons have something that they they're doing for the Lord. And they continue. Uh -huh. All right, Philippians 1.25. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you for your furtherance and joy of faith. I know, I know I'm going to abide. I know I'm not going to die now because I can see I've got this ministry I'm performing to you. Uh -huh. I have this confidence it's going to keep on. See, this so you don't have to worry about when am I going to be taken, when am I you're going to be taken when your work's done. That's, that's when. You can have this confidence. Just keep, keep on working. Even if the world says retire, keep on. Amen. And how about being made a partaker of Christ? That's an implication. It's something that's tied to assurance. Hebrews 3.14, And we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. So here... Partaking of Christ, that's, that's a pretty pretty big item. Partaking of Christ. That goes deeper than walking with Christ. That's, it goes deeper than that, see? I mean, his, you're part of his nature, you're partaking of it. Some of his traits, you're enjoying them. But partaking with Christ is a tide to assurance. That when you have assurance, you don't have to work at this happening, this is an implication of assurance. So when you have assurance, you are a partaker of Christ. That's what you are in Christ Jesus. And how about this <coughs> recompensive reward? I trust you see what I'm saying here, that these things are all connected yeah. with assurance. So if you have assurance, all this, this is just part of the, the plentitude that comes along with it. Hebrews 10.35, cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. You mean that God will reward me because I was confident? Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> Indeed he will. And this is going to be a good reward. I don't mind telling you. Great recompense of reward. And one, one other. 1 John 3.21, something tied now. To assurance, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. 
He doesn't say, if our heart doesn't condemn you, then you'll get confidence. That's not. He says, then we have. That's your proof. Mm -hmm. When your heart doesn't condemn you, that's your proof you have confidence. <laughs> it's an implication of assurance. It comes along with it. Now, when it says, if our heart condemns us not, it means when you're, bef when you're standing before God, if your heart doesn't condemn you. Now, talk about you're living out in Never Never Land, your heart doesn't condemn you. You can have a dead conscience. You talk about when you're in the presence of God and in His presence, when you're acutely aware of Him, you're not condemned. You feel, I can receive. To be condemned, you're in a receiving mode. That's proof you have assurance. Amen. Amen. So our brother, brethren, our salvation is supported by an eternal purpose. It's upheld by preparations that were made before the world began. It's supported by the removal of sin. <clears throat> it's fortified by the presence and the work of deity. <clears throat> it's guaranteed by a thorough defeat of the foe. Amen. It's underwritten by a pointed resurrection of the dead. See, no person in Christ has a right to not have assurance. And assurance is a big, big item because it comes with a tremendous warehouse of resources and there are a lot of intangibles that have to do with being confident and persuaded and joyful and peaceful and things like this. It all comes with assurance. So now. In view of that, if someone says, well, we can't know we're saved, see how, yeah. see how disastrous yeah. that is? Who, who do you think authored a statement like that? Yeah. Huh? This, 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 some, this, this the serpent has done this. He's raised yeah. up questions like you can't really know. When assurance is, in fact, knowing. Amen. And when you know, it unlocks the door. To all these resources we just have talked about. Amen. Brother Michael has our exhortation.